Today, we're going to talk about how life is cruel by discussing the phenomenon that is post-infectious IBS, which is basically irritable bowel syndrome that develops after someone has experienced an acute gastrointestinal infection like stomach flu, maybe food poisoning, or even traveler's diarrhea. And I realize I sound dramatic by saying that this is evidence that life is cruel, but come on, is there anything more cruel than life being like, okay, She's got this issue going on. She's violently ill right now while she's on vacation. You know, one of the only weeks of vacation she gets every single year. And she's visiting family and sharing a bathroom with in-laws as she's losing fluids from both ends at any hour of the day. But hold my beer. Got a character building idea. What if we turn this into a chronic condition that is... IBS. And fortunately, life often gives us just a little bit of mercy to where we are relieved of the really intense, acute phase of the illness. But then we are left with lingering symptoms that happen in IBS, like abdominal pain, maybe some bloating, or even diarrhea here and there. Now, if you're here because life has been cruel and you suspect that maybe you have post infectious IBS, then I hate to welcome you to the club, but know that you're not alone. I mean, not everyone who gets an acute gastrointestinal illness develops IBS afterward, but in the United States alone, it is estimated that 5.1 million people every single year develop IBS after having had one of these infections. And it's also estimated that conservatively, I should say, that 9% of people that have IBS may have acquired their IBS after having had an infection like this. Now, one thing I wanna point out is that having a history of an acute gastrointestinal infection is one of the strongest known risk factors when it comes to the development of IBS. So it only makes sense that we do our due diligence here and cover this topic sufficiently. So first things first, what causes post-infectious IBS? So for there to be the development of this form of IBS, there has to be some form of infection, and that infection can come from multiple places So three of the different types of infection that have been tied to post-infectious IBS have been from bacterial infections, viral or protozoal slash parasitic infections. So some examples of bacterial infections might be things like salmonella, campylobacter, shigella, E. coli infections, C. difficile infections, cholera, things of that nature. I'll list some additional ones out here for you. And then also viral infections like norovirus, rotavirus. And then when it comes to the protozoal slash parasitic infections, the one that I've seen most commonly mentioned is a Giardia infection. So why would having an infection from one of these pathogens possibly lead to the development of IBS? That is not totally understood, there are some suggested mechanisms for why something like this might be happening. You know, maybe it has something to do with changes to the gut microbiome. Maybe it has something to do with lasting inflammation or changes in immune activity after having had the infection. Or maybe the infection leads to increased states of intestinal permeability. Again, we don't fully understand why, and these are just a few of many possible theories, and it may also even depend on the specific pathogen that you are encountering for how it might mechanistically be leading to IBS-related symptoms. So we don't totally know why, but the association does appear to be very clear that having an infection like this does seem to be a setup in some cases for developing IBS symptoms. So when it comes to the symptoms that are experienced as part of having post-infectious IBS, those symptoms don't necessarily differ all that much from a general IBS diagnosis. So you might have issues like abdominal pain, bloating and distension, and then some bowel habit abnormalities, but particularly diarrhea, so much so that when it comes to the subtypes that people with post-infectious IBS seem to have, 90% of the time, people fall into either the IBS-M or IBS-D category. So there's often a diarrhea component to post-infectious IBS. Before we continue, I want to quickly tell you about IBSprobiotics.org. So this started out as a research project, but then we ended up turning it into this really cool comparison tool. When you go on the site, you can easily compare which probiotics were most effective for different IBS symptoms all exclusively based off of clinical studies. In fact, we spent the past two years building it, having analyzed over 50 different probiotics across more than 75 placebo-controlled trials. And the results surprised us. 
For example, we found that some really popular probiotics were nowhere near as effective as some lesser known options. And there were even some probiotics that seemed to do more harm than good. So I hope this free tool helps you to cut through the marketing hype and saves you a ton of time when evaluating a probiotic. So what are your odds of developing post-infectious IBS? I think for context, it helps understand just how high your odds are of even having the type of infection that can lead to post-infectious IBS to begin with. So in the United States alone, the CDC reports for 2022 that on average, people here would be experiencing about 0.92 to 1.27 cases per person per year. So roughly one case per person per year of some sort of acute gastrointestinal illness causing diarrhea and or vomiting. Now, I know that statistic sounds very alarming and high, and there are probably several unicorns out there that do not encounter these types of infections that often. But I will say, as a parent who has children who go to the cesspool schools where there are all of the germs and all the norovirus to be brought home, I think people like myself are probably keeping this statistic nicely elevated for the rest of you. So hopefully we are taking a hit and taking one for the team here. And hopefully most of you are not encountering these kinds of illnesses quite that often. In fact, just the sheer volume of intestinal illnesses I have faced as a parent has left me with some pretty disastrous bouts of GI illnesses. <laughs> so um, just case in point, there was one instance where I was 36 weeks pregnant and hospitalized with norovirus after getting severely dehydrated from vomiting. And then there was this other instance where I was on this multi-day cross-country road trip with my children in the middle of nowhere, Utah, during a blizzard when everyone in the car became violently ill. So I'm just going to throw it out there that I don't think these stories can be topped. If there's someone out there that has some sort of GI illness where you think your story tops mine, I actually would really love to hear about it in the comments section just for the sake of commiserating and because I have yet to find someone that can beat me on this. And I know it's not a competition or anything, but like, give me this one, guys. This is all I got. So back on topic here. Basically, the gist of this is that you are likely to encounter the type of infection that might lead to post-infectious IBS fairly routinely, maybe even as often as once per year or possibly more, depending on your occupation. If you have children, I don't know if that's actually true, but I'm just saying from personal experience and maybe even based off of if you travel certain places where there might be higher rates of these types of infections or yeah, those are the factors that are coming to mind. So now that we've established that your odds of facing some sort of acute gastrointestinal illness are pretty high at some point in your life, even on a yearly basis, what are the odds that that type of infection might actually result in post-infectious IBS. So to answer this question, we ended up looking at this meta-analysis, which evaluated 45 different studies. And throughout these studies, there was a total of over 21,000 individuals that were evaluated for different time points, depending on the study, for anywhere from three months to 10 years after having had an acute gastrointestinal illness. And what we learned from this meta-analysis is that the prevalence and risk of developing post-infectious IBS varies by the type of infection, be it bacterial, viral, or protozoal slash parasitic, and the time frame in which studies assessed post-infectious IBS, for example, within one year or greater than one year since the infection. What we saw was that the risk of developing post-infectious IBS is highest within the first year after having had the gastrointestinal infection, and that risk amounted to greater than a fourfold increased relative risk of developing IBS within that one year time frame. And then the infections that appeared to carry the highest risk of post-infectious IBS within that first year were viral infections followed by bacterial infections and lastly, protozoal parasitic infections. And the overall post-infectious prevalence was around 10% within one year of the acute gastrointestinal illness. Now, the good news is, is that after that one year time frame has been passed, it seems as though the overall risk of having post-infectious IBS goes down to somewhere in the ballpark of greater than a twofold relative risk of having IBS. So still elevated, but not quite as elevated as we see within the first year of having the infection. But something that's kind of interesting is that the 
pathogens, which seem to carry the highest risk of post-infectious IBS after a year, differ from those that are seen within the first year. So the highest rate of post-infectious IBS appears to be from protozoal infections, followed by bacterial infections, and then lastly, viral infections, which is kind of the inverse of what we see within that first year time frame. Now, one thing I want to point out about the elevated risk for protozoal infections after that one year time frame is that that elevated risk is related to Giardia infections. And one issue is that some of the studies that have evaluated people that have had Giardia infections and their incidence of post-infectious IBS risk is that not all studies confirmed that the Giardia pathogen had been eradicated. And when it comes to Giardia infections, those can present with very similar symptoms to post-infectious IBS. So it's not clear if the risk of post-infectious IBS is truly that elevated for protozoal infections, or if maybe we just happen to be measuring chronic giardiasis in some of these studies. But I think the biggest take home here is that depending on the type of infection that you encounter, that your risk of developing post-infectious IBS may differ. Now, when it comes to different factors that might increase your risk of having post-infectious IBS, it's not just the type of infection that you have that may or may not elevate your risk. There are also some other risk factors that can elevate your risk, including things like female gender, being of a younger age, less than 60, the severity of the infection, including diarrhea duration greater than seven days while you have the infection, or other factors like abdominal pain during the illness, bleeding per rectum during the illness, anxiety, depression, recent adverse life events, sleep disturbances, or a family history of functional bowel disorders such as IBS. Also, factors like antibiotic use during the illness may or may not increase risk, and we're not quite sure based off of mixed evidence on that. Now, something to add to this is that the risk of developing post-infectious IBS appears to compound based on the number and types of risk factors you have co-occurring at once, and the true incidence of post infectious IBS is hypothesized to be underestimated due to the high incidence of these acute gastrointestinal illnesses and also poor recall of our memories just from milder episodes. But I think the key takeaway is when it comes to your odds of developing post-infectious IBS after an intestinal infection is that broadly speaking, the overall risk of having post-infectious IBS within the first year is about 10%. So about a one in 10 chance after having that infection that it will turn into post-infectious IBS within that time frame, and that your individual risk may be higher or lower depending on the type of infection and the number and types of individual risk factors you have, which are associated with the development of post-infectious IBS. So how do you treat post-infectious IBS? Like I mentioned earlier, there's not a difference between post-infectious IBS treatment and general IBS treatment, with general IBS treatment generally coming down to things like diet, lifestyle, pharmacological, and psychological therapies. But when it comes to different medications and things of that nature that have been studied in post-infectious IBS, there really just is not a lot of evidence in that area. There have been some different anti-inflammatory kind of medications that have been studied in post-infectious IBS populations like mesalamine or corticosteroids, and the amino acid glutamine has also been studied in this particular population. Now, of the different therapies that have been studied specifically in post-infectious IBS, most have not produced favorable benefits for post-infectious IBS symptom improvement, with the notable exception of glutamine. Now, when it comes to glutamine, there was a study published in 2019 in post-infectious IBS patients with diarrhea and increased intestinal permeability, which noted clinically significant improvements in IBS symptom severity for 80% of the participants in the glutamine group during an eight-week clinical trial where they were taking glutamine at a dose of five grams three times per day. They also found improvements in this group for daily bowel movement frequency, stool consistency, and also for markers of intestinal permeability. So I think the key takeaway at this point when it comes to treating post-infectious IBS is that studies in people with post-infectious IBS for different treatments are very limited, with the most favorable results so far being for glutamine based off of evidence from a single clinical trial. So at this time, given the limited 
limited evidence out there. Treatment strategies that are recommended for post-infectious IBS do not differ from general IBS management strategies. So at this point, you're probably wondering, how do I know if I have post-infectious IBS? So one thing I want to make really clear is that there are no biomarker tests currently recommended by organizations such as the Rome Foundation or the American College of Gastroenterology, for instance that can be used to assess for this condition. Now, there are antibody blood tests out there that look for antibodies to toxins created by a certain bacteria that can cause acute gastrointestinal illness that maybe someday could be used to assess post-infectious IBS, at least as it pertains to certain types of infections. However, none of these tests have been validated exclusively in a post-infectious IBS population. So again, we just do not have any sort of validated biomarker test for post-infectious IBS at this time. And not to belabor this point, but I do want to remind you that there is really not a difference in how you treat post-infectious IBS as opposed to how you treat general IBS, at least at this time. So it doesn't really make sense to spend money on unnecessary testing that is, for one, not validated, but for two, is not going to change your course of treatment. So if there's no biomarker test for post-infectious IBS, how do you know if you have this condition? So basically, you'll know if you get a diagnosis of post-infectious IBS from your medical doctor, and your doctor will use guidelines that were published in 2019 from the Rome Foundation, which is a multinational organization that has given us the diagnostic criteria for IBS. I'll be sure to link to that 2019 publication from the Rome Foundation down below for those of you who might be curious about the specifics of what criteria must be met to be given a diagnosis of post-infectious IBS, just because reading through it would be pretty time-consuming. Now, as part of a workup to figure out if you have post-infectious IBS, it is possible that your medical provider may suggest limited testing to rule out some conditions, um, but only if there is high clinical suspicion that you may have something else that is not IBS. So some of the things that can be ruled out from time to time will be things like a chronic Giardia infection. And the basis for this is not to test for post-infectious IBS, but to simply rule out that you don't have this pathogen that's causing your symptoms. And typically this isn't recommended unless there is high suspicion that you have been exposed to the pathogen. Other things that may be ruled out will be things like celiac disease, tropical sprue, microscopic colitis, or inflammatory bowel disease under certain circumstances, depending on your presenting symptoms and your physician's best judgment. So when it comes to getting a diagnosis of post-infectious IBS, the biggest takeaway is that there are no biomarker tests currently validated or recommended by professional organizations for diagnosing this condition. And the diagnosis will come down to your physician seeing if you meet the diagnostic criteria for post-infectious IBS and possibly doing some limited testing if there is high clinical suspicion that maybe you have another condition that needs to be ruled out. Now, I want to end on a high note here by talking about the long-term prognosis of post-infectious IBS. And the good news is that the prognosis may even be better for post-infectious IBS than it is for general IBS. And that is because it's possible that symptoms may disappear or lessen over time. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some studies that have found symptoms to persist for people with post-infectious IBS for anywhere from 8, 10, or even 16 years following some sort of acute gastrointestinal infection. But several studies have found that risks of post-infectious IBS become non-significant beyond the three-year mark. So this suggests that symptoms of post-infectious IBS may lessen or resolve over time for many individuals. And that concludes this video on post-infectious IBS. But before I go, I also want to remind you that I absolutely would love to hear more about your worst acute gastrointestinal illness stories to see if anyone out there has a contender that can top one of my stories. So if you feel so inclined, please be sure to share in the comment section below. Thanks for watching this video. And as a quick reminder, don't forget to check out ibsprobiotics.org. We're really proud of this research project turned comparison tool that we've made. And of course, it is free and publicly available. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest IBS research, you can follow me here. See you next time.